Hello everyone. I am Ankit Kanodia from SmartSync Services, a SEBI registered investment advisory firm. Welcome to the 12th episode of Mission Smile guest webinars. A Mission Smile initiative where we invite guests from the industry every month and learn from their unique investing style. For those who are joining for the first time, Mission Smile stands for making new stock market investors learn it through engaging research. And Mission Smile app is now available on your Android phone. Just go to Play Store and type Mission Smile. Before we begin, I would request everyone to please keep yourself on mute and switch off the video so that we can have a seamless discussion and soak in all the knowledge. You may type in your questions on the chat box. We'll take all the questions as and when we get the opportunity. So let's begin. Today, our guest is Mr. Prabhakar Kudwa. Prabhakar is a successful long-only growth investor. Prabhakar has been selected as one among 40 under 40 investment managers by AIWMI, and that is Association of International Wealth Management of India. He has been generating market-beating returns across multiple years by cherry-picking a number of high-growth businesses, which have turned out to be big winners. He has been authoring a popular blog, Investment Insight India, on investment ideas for the past several years. And more recently, he is active on Market Sense Substack. I would highly recommend all of you to, uh, to read what he has written over the last one year or so, because I found it very interesting. He has also worked in financial technology product space, designing products for the capital markets. Prabhakar, in his capacity as the founder director of Samviti, focuses on unearthing long-term investment opportunities for the various long-only product uh, portfolios that Samviti manages. And the topic of today is investing in earning surprise, a powerful catalyst for winning stocks. With this, uh, Prabhakar, all over to you. I'll keep myself on uh, mute and my video will also be off. But I'll keep interrupting from time to time if I'll have any questions. Okay, over to you. Sure. Thanks, thanks, Sankit, for that kind introduction. And uh, no, I'm I'm really grateful that you invited me to this platform of yours. So, uh, what we'll try to do over the next, uh, you know, one one and a half hours is, uh, you know, I'll I'll share my experience, uh, you know, investing using a particular setup. You know, that has been very helpful for me to identify, you know, large winning stocks. Uh, so we'll, we'll go through the entire process, you know, right from, uh, you know, how can we uh, identify these kind of stocks? What are the different parameters or variables that come into play? And we'll also towards the end go into the nuances of uh, this particular setup because, you know, all said and done, I think it's important to understand that there are no formulas in state, you know, in the stock market. There is nothing straightforward. There is no one plus one equals two. So that there will always be nuances to, you know, every strategy, every setup. So we'll we'll try to cover, uh, you know, a bit of those nuances, uh, you know, as we go through this presentation. Yeah. Before we move uh, forward, a few disclosures I think are important. So I think this is, uh, you know, something that Ankit uh, has put for the smart sync services. Uh, Similarly, you know, I, I have my own disclosure, so I'm sure all of you are very well aware of these things. Uh, so what essentially these disclosures tell is that whatever we are discussing, you know, there will be a big bias. So a lot of stocks, sectors, names that we speak about, uh, you know, we or our companies or our associates might have holdings in them. And whatever we are discussing may not be complete in terms of the knowledge and information. So do not take any. Uh, you know, direct advice based on this information. Always uh, do your own due diligence, consult your financial advisor. And if you blindly follow, uh, you know, whatever you see here or, uh, you know, uh, here or read here, then there's a possibility that you can lose money. So with that background uh, behind us, let's, let's, you know, dive into the presentation. So a quick summary of what we'll do, like I said, uh, we'll first, you know, try to see uh, you know, what I'm going to talk about, does it really work or not, right? So we'll do a deep dive into big winners. Uh, and, and what we'll do is we'll 
not do this, you know, for any cherry picked stocks, you know, we'll not select a group of stocks and then try to retrofit the setup to it. What we'll do is we will look at the biggest winners in the last one year and then see whether our earnings stat list was instrumental in, you know, helping those stocks uh, rack up those gains. Right. So we will we'll do that. Then I'll explain the earnings stat list itself, right? What is it? How does it work? You know, what are the different, uh, you know, parameters? What are the different variables? We will talk about the process to find earnings surprises. You know, where do you find them? What is the source? How do you go about that process? And then we'll talk about the analysis of the earnings surprise, you know, so how do you, how do you So every year you might get, you know, every quarter you might get uh, 30, 40, 50, you know, or more earnings surprise events. So how do you figure out which ones to really pick? You know, how do you prioritize? We'll, we'll discuss that in the analyze earnings surprise uh, uh, section. Then we'll speak about the nuances of the setup. And most importantly, we'll speak about the portfolio construction. You know, how, how can you go about constructing a portfolio, you know, if you're following this setup. So before we start the actual topic, uh, I want everybody to learn about this concept called deep dive. Right. This this is not uh, you know this concept is not relevant only for the earnings setup that we are going to discuss today. This is a concept which is applicable across strategies and maybe in larger areas of our life also. So when I was studying you know uh, large successful investors and traders, uh, you know, and when I when I try to figure out how are how is it that these people learn, right? So so most of them basically what they do is they simply determine what is it that they want to achieve. You know, what is it that they want to achieve? So if you are an intraday trader, for example, your goals are different. If you're a swing trader, your goals are different. If you are an investor, your goals are different. So once you have established what your goal in the market is, what is it you know, that you want to achieve? You know, what is the time frame on which you want to trade, right? One of the most important decisions that we have to make as traders or investors is what is the time frame on which we, we want to operate, right? So am I am I operating on a intraday time frame or a swing time frame or a position trading time frame or a long term investing time frame? So once you've established that, what these successful uh, traders and investors do is they actually go back and study the historical occurrences of their time frame. So if you, if, for example, you are an intraday trader, then you will want to study hundreds of intraday charts to understand how does an intra intraday move start? You know, what leads to an intraday move? How does the intraday move progress during the day? How does the intraday move, uh, you know, end? When do you enter? When do you take profits? So only by studying the history, can you really understand and grasp and get a mind clarity as to how this setup really works practically in the markets. So I'm not a very big fan of, uh, you know, reading books to understand, uh, you know, markets, because although I'm a very avid reader and I, I've read a lot of books on markets, but as in, you know, uh, I've gained experience, I've understood that the best form of learning is, is to follow a deep dive approach, you know? So uh, in, in our case, you know, uh, a deep dive will essentially mean that what are we looking for? We are looking for identifying and participating in big winners in any given year. So that is the objective of this presentation. How can I identify and participate in the big winners, right? So what I have to do in order to really understand is I have to go back and study, you know, the last one years or last two years or last three years data as to, okay, what were the biggest winners of the last one year? What were the biggest winners of 2021? What were the biggest, biggest winners of 2020? And then go deep into it and understand, okay, what led to this price rise? You know, a price rise cannot happen on its own. There has to be a reason for it. You know, you, you know, a, a lot of people follow charts, but charts are, you know, the outcome. Charts are not the, you know, uh, they are not the reason why stocks go up. The charts will tell you what happened. But the real reason behind a move is always a catalyst. And most of the time, the reason behind big moves is an earnings catalyst. So I, I did the study, you know, I do the study every year. So I, I looked at the last one year's winners. You know, I, I go back and look at the last one year winners. 
and then try to figure out what is the common element among you know among these sorts right and and more often than not i would say 95% of the time there are only two reasons why a stock makes a big move number one news is that the number one cause is that there is a news which changes the perception of the future earnings right so and the second reason is that there is an actual earnings delivery that changes the perception of the future earnings so what really matters for the market is the future the present does not matter the past does not matter the market is actually a discounting machine so market wants to know or market wants to get hints as to what is likely to happen in the future <clears throat> so any time a news comes which tells the market or gives the market some hint as to what is likely to happen over the next one or two quarters the market will take that news and start repricing the stock sometimes you know in a lot of stocks which are not followed by the market an actual earnings delivery a surprise earnings delivery will prove to the market that oh something is happening here something big has changed because of which this company has given a big earnings delta and that is when the market will start re-rating it so you can go back and you know do this exercise yourself you know i uh, don't don't have to take my words for it and, and that is how i would prefer it if you really want to learn look at the big winners of any year not just this year look look at any year and you will find that in most of the cases if you go back and dig a little deeper the reason for the big gain will always be one of these two things so with you know so with that knowledge you know you know uh, with us we can really uh, build conviction you know we are not we can need not randomly bet on stocks so once we know that you know something like this works in the market by studying the past data it will allow you to utilize this you know in in the future years and the second thing is that this is a structural tendency of the market so when you say a structural tendency what do you mean you mean that this is something which is not dependent on uh, you know what is the whether i am in the indian market or whether i am in the us market or whether i am in the south korean market it doesn't matter this kind of an big rise led by either a news or an earnings catalyst can be seen across markets it's a very well documented uh, phenomenon the other other word that typically is used for it is called ped ped post earnings announcement drift so it is one of the biggest anomalies of the market which which disproves the efficient market hypothesis so one of the big anomalies of markets you know uh, of the efficient market uh, theory is momentum and a similarly large anomaly is the speed or the earnings surprise uh, you know edge so it's a structural tendency it, it has continued to work in the 1920s in the 1880s in the 2000s and i'm sure it will continue to work uh, you know even in 2030 or 2050 so because we are working with a structural tendency we can really you know we know that it is going to work so we can really put in the effort and the time to learn this because it is going to be worth it and you know that it is going to be there for the next several years it is going to deliver the you know output to you right so with that background let's go through some examples to understand this real time you know so i i don't want to like i said cherry pick but what what we'll do is we'll just go and look at the last one year's winners okay uh, and then see you know I, i'll 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 show it to you that uh, every winner the the move actually started you know sometimes the move starts earlier sometimes the move starts after the earnings event but in all cases there was an earnings surprise that led to that move okay so i will go into the details of this but just so that you understand the examples i'll tell you what an earnings surprise essentially means is you either see a big jump in the sales or a big jump in the operating profit or the ebitda so these are the two numbers you have to track so when when there is a big jump in the ebitda obviously that means that there is there has been a big jump in the margin so you want to see a big jump in the sales or the ebitda in some cases you will see a big jump in both which is an ideal situation so so these are the things you know on a very surface level that that you should uh, understand before we move forward so let's let's do a few case studies okay so uh, you know in the interest of time I, i'll just do about five large caps and five mid or small caps uh, so let me just navigate away from this presentation 
I'll take you to screener, okay? Uh, Ankit, this is visible, right? The screener? Yes, Prabhakar, it's visible. Okay, Go ahead. so let me create a screen for all of us. So let me say a market cap greater than 1000. We don't want very small companies. Okay, let's not get into that. And let me say I want to return over one year greater than 50. Okay, so we are looking for companies which in the last one year have given at least a 50% rate of return. So I will run this query. So I've got 133 companies. So this means that 133 companies actually returned more than 50% in the last one year. So the one year return is here. Okay. Now let's, you know, so there are two ways we can do this, you know, so we can start it by the return and then one year return and then, you know, uh, look at it or we can sort it by market cap. If we sort it by the one year return, right? So you will get a lot of these companies which are basically circuit stocks, you know, so I don't want to get into the circuit stocks because, you know, one can always argue that they're operator driven and, you know, or illiquid and all of that. So let's not get into all of these stocks because you'll always in any year find these kind of stocks which either give you an upper circuit or a lower circuit on a daily basis. So they are not our area of interest. Let's not, let's not get into that. So let me just sort it by market cap because market cap tells you that big companies cannot be manipulated by, you know, a small liquidity by some institution or, a, you know, or an operator and all of them. So if, if this is working on the large caps, then it pretty much means that it will work across the board. So, so let's sort it by market cap. The biggest winner in the last one year, not surprisingly is ITC, right? So, you know, it's, it's one of the most uh, hated stocks so pre this rally, a lot of uh, memes on Twitter and, you know, you, you know, you know, you know, all of it. So let me quickly just go into ITC financial results. Okay. And uh, this is the quarterly results. That is what we are interested in. Look at this December quarter number. Okay. A company which was doing about 10 to 13,000 crores of top line suddenly does a top line of 17,000 crores. It's a, obviously it's a material jump, right? So one of our criteria has been ticked. Similarly, if you look at the operating profit, although the operating profit does not have an equivalent jump, but it still is one of the largest operating profits compared to all the previous quarters. Right. So December 2021 results is when this particular earnings surprise, you know, the way I, you know, different people have different definitions, but the way I look at it, it qualified for my earnings surprise. Okay. So let me go to the results. I'm not going to analyze the results right now. I'm just going to show you when the result was announced. Okay. So it was announced on 3rd of February. So let's go to ITC stock. So we are talking about 3rd of February, 2021, right? So this is when the result was announced. Let's say you bought it on 4th of February, okay? You bought it here at 234. After that, the stock fell, fell no doubt, but that was because the overall market went into a big correction, right? So if I can go back and show you Nifty, Feb, right? So it's Feb 21. We need to go to Feb 22, I think. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Feb 22, yes. Let's see. Feb 22, third Feb. Yeah, if you see here, the market went into this big correction. The Nifty itself fell 10%, and that was probably because of that Ukraine war and all of that. So we'll, we'll go back to ITC. Anyway, let's say you looked at the results and the results qualified your criteria and you bought it here, right? And you held on to it, right? What happened after that? Stock made a big move. So from this date, ITC as of today has made a move of 60%. And from the high, uh, it, is, it has made a move of 67%, right? We'll talk about the nuances of how to construct the portfolio and, you know, how to hold the stock and all of that later.
But what I want to highlight to you is that look at the behavior pre this result, right? The stock was not going anywhere. It was range bound. And post this result, the stock fell along with Nifty. But as soon as the Nifty recovered, it was, it turned out to be one of the biggest winners and it went and gave you a 60% return over the last one year. That is ITC for you. Let's move on to the next company. And, and I'm not even, so ITC is not even the biggest winner. It is one of the big winners, right? So because I've sorted this by market cap now, let's remove ITC and let's go to, let's say in HAL, Hindustan Aeronautics. This is the second largest market cap winner in the last one year. Let's look at the numbers here. Okay. So if you see actually the earnings surprise happened here, right? The numbers, this is a very seasonal business. So you have to take into account that for a lot of government companies, the best quarter is always the Q4 because a lot of year end uh, order booking and all of that happens. So if you exclude the March, if you look at it, the, you know, uh, the, the big look at the December, so five, four to five, eight, one, two to one, four. So a company which was growing in single digits suddenly starts growing at 20, 25% for two quarters, right? September, it grew from 1000 crores to 1200 crores and from 1200 crores to 1400 crores. So let's look at the December numbers. Again, the same, same thing. When did the result come? The result came on 10th, February. Go to HL. Again, the results came somewhere here. This this E E in the trading view shows you when the earnings came. So the earnings came somewhere around 10th. So earnings came here. Again, look at this stock also. It fell post the earnings, and that would be the story of all the stocks because the market itself crashed 10%. From there, it is up almost 100%. Right? So, Bhakir, can I ask you a question here? Sure, yes. So uh, I can understand what you showed in terms of ITC, but yes. uh, the kind of growth numbers you have shown in case of HAL, yes, I think similar kind of growth numbers would have achieved by several other companies also, but they would not they would not have given you that kind of uh, stock market return in that period because I don't see that growth uh, too uh, too eye popping. So from four thousand two hundred to four thousand four hundred is about how much less than five ten uh, percent I would say. Right. Correct. 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 And which, which you are talking about this. Yeah. I'm talking about, if you look at uh, say December to uh, compare the December, 2020 to December, 2021 numbers. Correct. Correct. I agree. I agree. So I'll, so there, there are two or three other nuances to this. So I will talk about that later. So the reason why, uh, you know, uh, HAL, HAL worked is also because defense was a hot sector, you know, six, seven months, you know, since the last one year. So. And historically, you know, and there was there was a lot of uh, news flow about the order book and all of that, right? So the reason for HAL may not be as, uh, you know, uh, clear as it was for IT ITC, I agree, and that will not be the case for all the companies. But in, IT in case of HAL, the additional tailwind was the sector. So if you find, you know, like I said, multiple companies, which, you know, will give you similar numbers, so I'll cover that in the nuances, uh, you know, part that how, how do you choose between multiple such options? You know, how do you choose when you have, when you don't see a lot of growth, but the other things are lining up, then you can go back and, uh, you know, uh, reassess. And, and then you see, like I said, there are 133 stocks. There is no need for us to pick, you know, uh, because, uh, you know, in, in our portfolio at the max, we'll have about 20, 25 stocks. So right. there will always be companies which you will reject. There will always be companies which will not make sense, you know, but what I have done here is I'm going just, you know, uh, in the sort of market cap descending orders. So, I, so like, like I said, no, it's not a pick, pick the and chosen list. Right. So why, why HAL worked is something I will, you know, probably that nuance is something I will talk about, you know, uh, later in the 
presentation. Sure, sure. Please continue. Yeah. So let's move to the next one. That is Warren beverages. So I'm just going, like I said, market market cap wise. Let's look at Warren beverages. Okay. <clears throat> the breakout quarter clearly was the June quarter, right? Top top line. Look at the top line. You know, 60, 70 percent uh, jump in the top line. Right. Actually, from year on year, it's almost double. It's similarly a jump in the operating profit numbers. Right. So when when what when did this number come? So you can either consider this as the quarter. Or you may even consider this March 22 also as the quarter because March 22 was when it made the highest top line in the last several quarters. It did not make the highest operating profit, but it made the highest top line. Anyway, June is you know much more clearer. It made a big jump in the top line, a big jump in the operating profit. Let's look at when the results came. The date is 1st August 2022. Go to VBL. Thing. Here, first August. Yeah, first August. Let's say you bought it on second August. Okay, you bought it here, and the stock is up forty-two percent from August. No, it's not even one year since the results have come, but the stock is up forty-two percent. That was number three. Let's look at Adani power again, Adani stocks. You know, what I want to show you here is, like I said, see, there is, there is no formula, right? So, uh, what I, I just want to show you a pattern here. I, I am not saying, you know, these are the stocks to buy, or these are the stocks to not buy. I am showing you a pattern. I'm showing you a tendency that whenever there is a big earning surprise, more often than not, there will be a move that will happen you know in some cases the move will be small in some cases the move will be big in some cases the move you know may not happen at all so let's look at adani power you know of course anybody who bought it has you know is probably now underwater but like i said let's just see the pattern okay look at march march 2022 okay big jump in the top line a big jump in the operating profit let's look at the numbers fifth may is when the results came Go to Adani Power. Unfortunately, in stocks like Adani, what happens is look, the stock has already made a rally pre results, right? So, 5th May is when the result came. Let us say you bought it on the 6th May also. And on the 6th, 6th May. And from there also, if you look at the top, it has made a 48% move in the next 2 3 months. What happened after that is actually the opposite of what we are talking about. You know, an event or a news happened, which completely changed the future perception of the earnings of this stock. So there was a question mark on the promoter. There was a question mark on the leverage. There was a question mark on whether these companies, uh, you know, will be able to grow the way they have grown uh, in the past. Will they be? Will they continue to do equally well? And that was the second, you know, you call it a, a news surprise, which came, which led to this fall across all of the Adani stocks. But before that news, the pattern worked as it should have worked. So it doesn't matter whether it is uh, the best of the brief stock like ITC or, you know, a, a stock with a questionable uh, characteristics like an Adani par. The pattern is working across the board. That is the point I want you to take from. Let's quickly move on to the next one. Let's look at ABB. Okay. Again, a good stock. Look at the December quarter numbers. Highest top line in the last several quarters. Operating profit, not so much, but top line qualifies. Result was in 10th Feb. This was the result, I think. Yeah, 
10th Feb was the result. As usual, it fell along with the rest of the market. But since then, the stock is up 50%. And these are large cap stocks we're talking about. Okay, so enough of these large cap stocks. Let's quickly do a few mid cap stocks also. So it will, so if you go through this list at your own time and you know look at these numbers, it will all start making sense to you. Uh, let's look at uh, Jindal Saw. I'll do this quickly. I'm sure you guys are getting the gist. Right. Jindal saw made a breakaway earnings here in September. Right. It was it was in this three thousand half thousand range. In fact, let's even take December. Okay. If, if you feel September was not so great, even December, right? So it, it reported five thousand crores of top line, significantly higher than any of the last two quarters. Operating profit significantly higher than any of the previous quarters. This is this is one of the recent results and it, it might make more sense. Let's look at when the result came. The result came on January 25th. Go to Jindal saw. Bakar, if you see even March 2021 quarter was very good for them. That was also a breakout quarter for them. March Which 2021. One? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, we probably will have to go back there to see, but since I'm looking at this year's stop earnings, if I go ah, to the okay. March data, it will be like, uh, you know, benefit of hindsight kind of a thing. Right, 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 right. No, no get it, get it. Yeah. So, so this, you can, like I said, you can check this every year and you will find this pattern in most stocks. So December, uh, when was the result? Okay, I forgot. December, 20, uh, sorry, January 25th was when it was announced. So January 25th, okay. Where is January 25th? This is when the result was announced. Let's see you bought it the next day. Stock is up 30% in less than a month in an extremely horrible market that we are in right now. Very bad market. Okay. But see, mm -hmm. see. so this, this that, that's why it's a structural tendency. You know, it's it's a tendency that is very powerful. And if the right environment, the right tailwinds are there, then, you, you know, it can't just, the market can't help it, but it has to re-rate the stock. Quickly do quickly do one more. Let's let's take Ion Exchange, the last one. <clears throat> Again, I would say that this this was the breakout quarter, 496, right? Very large top line, large highest operating profit. Results came on May 27th, 2022. Ion switch May 27. So somewhere here, I think the results came. There was a gap up also on that day. And since that day, the stock is up 75%. So yeah, so these these were a few examples I wanted to run you through. And like I said, you can do this exercise on your own. Uh, it will take you a few quarters to get a hang of it, and there are, you know, uh, there are some some additional points which you'll have to uh, take into consideration, which which I which I'll discuss. So you can randomly pick any any stock from this list, and like I said, there'll be one of the two reasons: either there has been an earnings delivery, or there has been a news which tells us that the earnings delivery is coming in the next few quarters. Right. So sometimes this means there has been a order win. Uh, or there can be a news uh, that you know the the there has been a promoter change, or you know uh, there is a special situations. So all of those things also qualify. You know anything that tells us that the future earnings are going to be materially higher qualifies for this pattern. But a specific case that we are discussing today is where the actual earnings delivery happens because. If, if it's a news based thing, then you have to play it a bit differently, you know, because the risk reward profile will be different. Uh, although the news based stocks might actually give you a much higher return, but the earnings delivery based stocks are much more surer in nature. Right? It's, it's much more, uh, you know, you can be, you can have conviction and you can actually bet on them. Right? So with this case studies behind us, uh, I'll tell you why this happens. You know, what, what, what really is happening here? So. 
this this is a you know this is a Cinderella clock. You know, it it, it was built by Merrill Lynch. So, like I said, it is not something that I am you know either I have invented this or something like that. There's nothing like that. It is a very well known phenomenon. And it has been used across markets by several uh, institutions as well as hedge funds. The way it things work is this: so there is a cycle of earnings, right? So let's say a high growth stock, a stock is high growth. You know, this is twelve o'clock. So high growth stock, it delivers a bad earning. You know, it's called a torpedo. So the bad earnings torpedoes the stock. All the analysts revise their models. You know, negative surprise models. Estimates are revised. Stocks continue to fall. You know, dogs. So this is a phase where you know nobody cares about them. They, they became value stocks. Nobody is interested in them, so they are completely neglected. This is the area where value investors get in, interested. Typically, you will see very accomplished cyclical investors. What they want to do is they will buy when the margins are at their lowest. So they are actually coming in and buying here. They are buying when the margins are very low. The industry is neglected. There has been no growth in the last several quarters because such a situation gives them a mouthwatering valuation. So the value investors come in here. We come in here. We don't buy early. We are okay to pay a slightly higher price, but we want to get in once the earnings delivery starts. So as soon as there's a positive earnings surprise, the cycle starts in the other direction. So a lot of this positive surprise models, a lot of traders start getting interested in it. Estimates are revised. So a lot of in, a lot of investors get started, you know, getting into it. Then the momentum players start getting in, you know, getting into it. And finally, the stock again tops out. So this is the full cycle that almost every stock goes through. You know, there will be a period. This will be the period where everything will be gung ho about the company. The company would be giving back to back quarters of very good numbers. And suddenly, if one quarter disappoints, then the entire the price fall will start. And then the price fall will feed on itself and the stock will continue to keep falling till the next big positive earnings surprise comes. So it's a very important uh, chart that you know all of you should uh, you know look at. Like I said, the source of this is the Merrill Lynch uh, quantitative analysis. Okay, so let's get into before we move ahead, uh, yeah. if you can just go back to that slide, uh, Prabhakar. Yes. So, uh, as you mentioned that you will probably come in when there is a positive surprise. Correct. So, are you going to cover that in your subsequent slide? When do you get out? Or Yes, yes, uh, yes. I will, I will okay. cover that. I will then cover I'll reserve that. my questions. Yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. Yes, yes. If, if anybody has any questions, they can please put it in the chat and maybe Ankit can you know ask the questions for you. Uh, or we can do the questions uh, post the presentation also. Yeah, you can continue. I'll, I'll uh, come in between whenever required. Sure. So now let's get into the you know a little bit of uh, the meat of the you know thing. Uh, so what you know so what really is an uh, earning surprise and what are the different conditions? Because what I showed you earlier was a quick overview. You know I did not go deep into the details of uh, you know what really you have to look for. But basically you know if I have to list out the various factors, then these are the various factors that you have to look out for. Right. So number one you know that is the only factor we looked at. That there has to be a massive sales or operating profit beat, right? So there has to be a massive improvement in the top line or the operating profit or both, right? And when I say massive, the massive is subjective. Everything in the stock market is subjective, right? So a company that is a very slow-growing company, uh, you know, if it starts giving you 10, 15 percent uh, uh, earnings growth, which was earlier growing at single digit. And that's massive for that company. You cannot expect, uh, you know, uh, a company like uh, Hindustan Lever to grow at 30, 40% top line. For Hindustan Lever, even a 15, 16% top line is a massive beat. So the massive has to be seen in the context, right? So there has to be a massive beat and there has to be an acceleration in the numbers. So when I say acceleration in the numbers, there has to be the, the growth rate, you know, so you, let's say you bought it on the first earnings beat. The set for the for the move to continue, there the growth has to continue. You know, so the, if if it is a one quarter wonder, a lot of companies here will be one quarter wonders. So if the growth has to continue to accelerate, so if, if the first surprise was a ten percent surprise, the next surprise has to be higher than a ten percent surprise. 
so so these are the best case scenarios i'm telling you all of this may not happen all the time but if you want the best of the best setups then there has to be a massive beat and there has to be an acceleration in the subsequent quarters the third and the third thing is market reaction you know a lot of times uh, we we you know we have to look at the market reaction uh, especially in bull markets in a bear markets it's you know difficult to gauge the reaction because like we saw in the case of itc after the results the stock actually fell before you know uh, going up again so but in case of a bull market you know when the market is good then you you expect the market to react positively so your analysis and the market's analysis has to match right especially in a bull market if you feel that it's a blockbuster earning but the market is not at all reacting to it then you have to take a step back and you know re reassess right the fourth condition is neglect so you ideally want a stock that is neglected like i showed you in case of itc the stock had gone nowhere for the last 3 to 6 months so ideally before this earning surprise you want to see price neglect you want to see analyst neglect you know you want to see neglect in any form is good you know because that means that there is no froth in the stock and you know there is enough uh, upside left for us to participate and of course limited analyst coverage this is important more for the mid and small caps and and uh, like like i showed you it works or, or, you know work for the large caps also even where there is an analyst coverage uh, but limited analyst coverage is better you know uh, and obviously it will work much better for the mid and small caps than for the large caps because large caps are much more uh, you know well covered by the community so the surprise element typically is lower there so but in a mid and small cap the surprise element generally is much higher so it will work much better in a mid and small cap universe so let's sort of break down you know each of these so when like i said when i say massive beat it has to be a revenue margin operating profit beat and ideally the most important point here is that you want to get in in the first quarter or the second quarter of the beat you don't want to get in post that there is no point in getting in late in the, in the setup you either have to get into first quarter or the second quarter right like i said acceleration acceleration means back to back growth and it can also mean that a company which was growing slower suddenly starts growing faster so 15% growth company is growing at 50% growth that is something which qualifies as acceleration and that is something which should get you interested the next like i said is the market reaction right so you want to see a gap up and an explosion in the volume also so if you want to be sure that your analysis and the market's analysis is matching then you want to see a gap up on generally the results are announced post market some cases they come during market but most of the results in india are announced post market post market so next day morning when the stock opens there will be a there should be a gap up and there should be a significantly higher volume uh, to prove that this is indeed a surprise to the market and like i said more relevant in a bull market in a bear market there will be a lot of uh, confusion a lot of times even with good results the stock will not react it will test your patience and you know you will have to figure out uh, you know how to trade this in, in in a bull market separately from how you how you trade this in a bear market so like i said neglect you know uh, you you want it to be range bound pre earnings you don't want to see a big move pre earnings so if the stock has already moved up 50 60% pre earnings then you want to be a little bit suspect because that means that the insiders or whoever you call them have already taken a position and post the news right as they say uh, you know buy on rumor sell on news in the market right a lot of times what happens is the stock rallies pre the results and post the results even if the results are blockbuster you know the people who bought before will create supply and they will sell the stock and the stock will go range bound even though the numbers are very good so you have to be a bit careful about such situations where the stock has already uh, you know rallied like i said limited coverage is one one of the special cases of this i have seen is ipo or demerger kind of stocks right so ipo or demerger kind of stocks you know the the advantage with these stocks typically is that generally their float is very less because the float is very less you combine that with a surprisingly good earnings 
what happens is the supply of the stock completely vanishes and whatever a small buying comes can give rise to explosive moves. So if you have an opportunity or if you come across an IPO or a demerged name, right, which has given you a big earning surprise, then you have to prioritize that over a similar candidate which has been trading in the market for a long time and which has a much higher float. So the advantage with this IPO and demerger stocks is that, that it is, they have very low float. So any good news can give you, you know, a much bigger move than, you know, any other, other stock. Again, a social media noise. So the limited, the more limited the social media noise is the better. You know, in some cases like ITC, it was negative social media noise, right? So which was, which turned out to be good for the stock. So it's again, open to, you know, interpretation. So like I said, large caps also it works, but mid and small caps, it works uh, significantly better. So what typically happens uh, post an earning surprise, you know, uh, so I, I'll give you, a, you know, having, having done this for uh, several quarters, I, I can give you a broad sense, right? A good earning surprise in a good market environment will give immediately give you an at least 20 to 25% uh, move you know, before the next quarter, right? An excellent one, you know, where all the checklist is lining up, you know, the top line is explosive, the margins have expanded, the operating profit is, as ex, you know, is explosive, there has been neglect, it is a mid and small cap stock, it is an IPO demerger name, when everything lines up, then you can even get a 50 to 100% move, you know, in a, in a quarter or less, or sometimes in a couple of quarters. So in a bull market, it's very easy. In a bull market, you know, you, your, even if you make mistakes in the analysis, you know, you will still, uh, you know, do quite okay. However, in a bad market environment, what will happen is, you know, there are multiple scenarios here, right? So sometimes what happens is the stock will go up and then fail, you know, it will go up and give back the gains and go into a consolidation. So a current market environment, right? The one we are in, in the last two, three, four months can be categorized as a bad market environment. It is not a horrible market environment, but it is not a great market environment, right? It's not a bull market for sure. Right, so uh, we are in a reasonably bad market environment. So in such a market, what will happen is stocks will go up and uh, they will give up, give back the gains. They will go sideways. There will be certain stocks, you know, like Jindal Soy is one example. And this quarter, you know, Apar was another example. You know, Apar Industries also, uh, you know, if you go back and see the chart, it was post the earnings surprise that it really took off. So you'll, you will always find stocks, even in a bad market, which will do well, on an earning surprise, but since we are talking about a generic general scenario, I would say that in a bad market environment, we need to exercise more patience. A lot of times the stock will give back the gains. They may even correct 10, 20, 30%, depending upon the severity of the bear market. But as soon as the bear market ends, you know, uh, a lot of examples like this, even in the COVID you know, phase, a lot of companies which were doing well pre COVID, right? Uh, they fell in the COVID uh, fall. But as soon as the COVID, uh, you know, the rally started and these companies posted the next quarter with good numbers, the stocks just took off. So it, it's, so one is the earning surprise itself. And the second most important parameter that you have to keep in your mind is the market environment. Without a market environment, no strategy will work. So any strategy that you're running in the market will the, fun, the, the success of that strategy in any given year will depend on the market environment. If the market environment is good, even a bad strategy will work very well. If the market environment is bad, then even a good strategy, you know, sometimes will not work. So, so that is something you have to keep in and you have to tweak your, you know, you have to make tactical changes to how you deal with the strategy, depending upon the market environment. So, like I said, if a COVID type of scenario happens, then every stock will fall then we cannot sit and justify that, uh, you know, the earnings are good. Once a liquidation kind of a scenario happens, then nothing matters. So in that case, you either have to, you know, uh, sit with your stocks or you have to figure out an appropriate, uh, you know, stop loss exit mechanism, right? So how to improve your odds, right? Uh, so like Ankit said, right? A lot of companies, like when, when I was showing HAL, you know, Ankit pointed out that the growth was okay. It was not so great. Right. So how do you, you know, how do you uh, take that decision, you know, whether you should pick that stock or not? The most important thing is you have to figure out the source of earnings improvement. 
because the most important question that we are asking is, is this sustainable or not? That is the most important question. So the first quarter of Blockbuster earnings is just telling us, giving us a hint that something good may be happening here. Pay attention, right? So if you understand the source of the earnings you know, improvement, then you can go back and uh, you know build conviction that yes, I think that this will continue for the next two quarters, right? So that is very important. Go back and find out how the earnings improvement happened, what is leading to it. Second is the hint is if there is an improvement across the sector, then your analysis is more likely to be correct. So in case of HAL, for example, the entire defense sector was doing well. The entire defense sector was getting orders. There, there was news flow around it. On top of that, HAL gave you know decent numbers or much better than what it was doing in the past. The growth rate may not be great, but like I said, compared to its own growth rate, it was good. Add to that improvement in the sector, you know, and and you know the other example of that right now I would say is the power the power sector, right? Uh, stocks which are related to power capex. So whether you look at uh, an LG, look at a Volta, if you look at an Apar, and all of these kind of companies across the board, there has been an improvement in earnings, which tells you that there is uh, some tailwind there in this sector. So you you know it 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 tells you that your analysis is more likely to be correct, and that this earnings is more likely to be durable. Of course, quality of neglect. Like I said, the more you know, the less the stock is talked about, the better. So if you have to prioritize between a stock which is very well known and everybody on Twitter is talking about it and another stock which has given very good earnings but nobody is even talking about it, pick up the stock which nobody is talking about it for obvious reasons that there is no froth in that stock and the upside can be much higher. A stock which everybody is talking about, you know, uh, an example of that, you know, not connected to the earnings thing but I, I would say is the Ambuja cement, right? Everybody and his brother seems to be owning Ambuja cement today. Right, so that you know, so that, that neglect is missing. Everybody is playing the Adani rally using Ambuja cements, which so Ambuja cements will do well. It's it, it might still do well over the long term, you know, with the you know uh, disclosure that you should do your own uh, uh, you know uh, due diligence. But what I'm saying is, in the short to medium term, the neglect element is very important. You know, if the neglect is not there, then the stock can continue to go sideways for a long time and frustrate you. Right, so neglect. With an earning surprise, you know, with an improvement across sectors, you know, if all three are all three of them are there, then that is how you prioritize. Market environment, I already spoke about a good market environment. This strategy or setup will work much better than in a bear market. But even in a bear market, it will work well enough to allow you to do reasonably well and much better than you know many other strategies. <clears throat> then is the starting valuations, right? So if there is an earning surprise on DMART, you know, I might be a bit more careful, uh, you know, than if the earning surprise is on, you know, some unknown stock, uh, which, you know, which where the valuations are, you know, 10p, 7p, 6p, I would be more, you know, I would rather play the smaller stock with a lower valuation than a, a stock with a much higher valuation where the P's are in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and like that. So starting valuations matter because starting valuations is what will give rise to the re-rating. Already spoke about new industry IPO. No, IPO, I already spoke about the float element. New industry is typically where, you know, uh, like EV, right? Anything related to uh, electric vehicles right now is going well. Now, what happens when there is a new industry in the market is that a lot of liquidity flows to that new industry. So if you see any any bull run, you know most of the bull runs uh, happen in a new industry. You know, uh, so if you see uh, the 2000 bull run was in technology, and you know, uh, it, it, when I say a new industry, it means something that has, you know, either it's a completely new technology or something that has not been spoken about for the last several years. You know, so anything that is doing well now, which is not being spoken about. You know, comes uh, to, you know those candidates are better chosen you know than the typical uh, popular ones. Again, small cap is greater than mid cap is greater than large cap, which is obvious uh, because of the under researched uh, you know uh, small caps. They give you much better price move when there is a surprise when compared to a large cap. But having said that, 
the liquidity also matters. A lot of these small caps don't have enough liquidity for you know all of us to participate. Uh, but adjusted for liquidities, you know the the equation is the small caps will do much better than mid caps, which in which in turn will do much better than large caps. Uh, let's move on to, you know, when does it fail, right? So, like I said, there is no formula, right? There is no hundred percent guarantee. And when to exit, right? These are two most important questions. So, like I said, sometimes you will get into a stock which is doing, you know, which which gives you a blockbuster numbers, but the very next quarter it will disappoint massively. There are many such stocks in our market. So, I, I right. So, if you if you enter on the basis of very good uh, quarter and you you have your own reasons to believe that the company will do well but the very next quarter it gives you a howler of a result then you have to really reassess if you want to stay in those companies you know so in some cases you might want to give them more time you know you might want to give them one more quarter but more often than not if the tail if the actual tailwind was there then it should have continued the you know the good run into the second quarter so companies which don't do do that typically should be disqualified and you'll have to find a way to exit those stocks. Second is, you know, like managements with bad track record, right? Don't get re-rated, you know, unless there is a massive improvement. So a lot of times what will happen is uh, if a company is showing good numbers, then so all these are very generic points I'm making. You can always find exceptions to them. But a lot of times if a company with a bad corporate governance or you know unknown company let's say you know not necessarily bad the first quarter of improvement will not be respected by the market the market will not believe them the market will say okay give me one more quarter and then you know then we'll see so a com you know companies with uh, you know which are not very well known or sleepy companies when they give you a good number the market will typically wait for two quarters and two quarters of back to back good numbers is what will lead to the re rating. The first quarter, it sometimes doesn't happen. Right? Bear phases, you will see a drawdown. You have to have a mechanism to sit through the bear phase. You know, there, there is no running, running around from it. If you have stop losses and all of that here, it will not work. Like I showed you in the case of ITC itself, if you had a stop loss and all, it would have hit the stop loss and then gone on to make a 70 80% move. So you have to have a mechanism to sit through this, and I will talk about that in the next one or two slides. Uh, the other thing to be very careful about is once you're once you're into this, uh, you know, into this setup, is the concept of peak margin, peak earnings. There will come come times, you know, when you will let's say you got in in quarter number one, and by the time the company is in quarter number three, the margins are so high that you know the of course the numbers are blocked best in quarter three but the margins are so high compared to its own history or compared to its own peers you know it you can be sure that it is happening because of some temporary uh, thing you know like a raw material uh, you know a tailwind or something like that or some supply disruption somewhere in such cases you have to exit even before the next result comes a lot of cases market itself will start uh, you know, uh, recognizing peak margin, peak earnings, and it will start derating the stock. So if you are in a good, and the latest quarter has given such a super high margin that that margin is very difficult to be beaten in the subsequent quarters, then you have to immediately exit because a margin is is you know the earnings are very 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 sensitive to margin changes. You know. A 1% change in the margin can lead to a 20-30% change in the earnings. So margins, if you are in a peak margin kind of a thing, then you have to stay cognizant and you have to, you know, exit it much before the next result. The other way to exit it, like I said, most of the times these moves will get over in third or fourth quarter. Right? By third or fourth quarter, everybody in the market will be talking about it. You know, there is no element of neglect. So if you bought something, it has done very well. You know, it's been two, three, you know, I think ITC kind of qualifies for that now. You know, it has been two, three quarters, a big run has happened. You know, it, it's kind of time where you, you, you know, uh, look at uh, partially exiting, booking your profits or getting out completely into a new idea. Uh, the other thing is, you know, situations where the earnings are good, but there are no cash flows, right? So companies with huge receivables, you know, and so if you, if you understand why the cash flow is not there, like in some case of some government companies, you know that the cash flow comes only at the year end. 
So in such cases, you can make exceptions, but generally you want to see good earnings with good cash flows. And most important point, please do not confuse this to be a buy and hold for multiple years kind of a, you know setup. Like I said, this is a three or four quarter play at the max. By third or fourth quarter, it will become stale. Everybody will know about the earnings. You have to you know, exit it between the first and the fourth quarter. In very, very rare cases, you know, uh, you can probably continue to hold it uh, much beyond that, but do not confuse this with a buy and hold forever kind of uh, you know, setup. So where do you find these uh, earning surprises? Right, so the source that I use is bscindia.com. I think the NSE website somehow, you know, not very comfortable with it. The BSC uh, is where all the results come. So you have to prepare for this, you know, result season, uh, you have to understand how is it spread out. The result season typically will start at the beginning of the quarter, uh, beginning of the next quarter, right? So, for example, uh, right now we are in uh, March, right? So, April, the result season will start. The initial 10 15 days, there'll be the meat of the results will start from 15th uh, April to uh, you know 15th uh, May or so. So a lot of results will come, you know, uh, at that point in time. So you have to prepare, you have to, you know, be up to date with the result calendar. What are the results which are there tomorrow? Which are, what are the results which are there day after tomorrow? So you can build a lot of setups, you know, with this, you know, a lot of times uh, stocks will rally into the results. If the last quarter has been good, then this quarter, the stock will rally even before the results sometimes. So you have to have a good sense of, you know, when the results are announced, and when is the result likely to come? Right? Day and time of the result, you have to be ready, especially if you have a watch list and you're looking at a you know a particular set of stocks, then you have to be ready because you have to act quickly. Because like I said, in a bear market, you will get opportunities, but in a bull market, the stock will just take off. It will not give you, you have to buy on the day of the result or the next day. If you buy beyond that, a lot of times in a bull market, you will not, the stock will run away very quickly and a lot of gains from the table will, you know, go for a toss. So during market results will come again, if it's very difficult for a, you know, individual to play this because you have to be really prepared. So sometimes, you know, during market results will come, which will give you an opportunity to get in immediately. If you can, if you can analyze these things very quickly, most results will be post market. Uh, so you will have at least the overnight time, you know, uh, post market in the evenings results will come. So you will have time to really look at the results and, and nowadays, uh, you know, screener also is, you know, updating the results quite uh, fast. So you'll be able to do a comparison also quite quickly. Uh, so post market is where most of the, you know, action, I think will be more applicable to most of us during market is a bit of a stretch because you have to be very quick to analyze and, you know, decide and you know, move ahead. And then, then finally, you have to post the result. You have to do the analysis, like like we discussed. What are the different parameters you have to look at? Uh, finally, let's look at the portfolio construction. You know, like I said, this is a setup where you know you, the odds of you know working are high if you find the right candidates. So if if all the conditions are matching, then the odds that you will make money are quite uh, high. Uh, so, but we have to be diversified, right? So, like I said. You, you will go wrong. You know, there will be situations where you think the results are good. Everything is great, but the market will not, uh, you know, uh, encourage it or market will not really move. So you have to diversify. <clears throat> Optimum size, according to me, is about 20 to 30 stocks. And what this 20 to 30 stocks will do is it will obviously give you the risk management, built in risk management. You know, you know, when you say 20 to 30 stocks, you know, you are taking about, you know, three, three to 4% in each stock kind of a bet. So even if something doesn't work, you know, you will, you'll still be able to manage, you know, you'll still be able to book out at a small loss and, you know, at the portfolio level, you will not have a huge impact, but most. It gives us a lot of times I've seen the best performing stock in my portfolio will definitely not be the one which I thought will perform the best. It will always be a surprise. So when you spread out your bets in 20, 30 names, the one that gives you the surprise, the possibility of that, you know, bringing in that element of luck, that element of, uh, you know, surprise within your portfolio will be much higher. But of course, there has to be a sweet spot. You know, you cannot buy 100 stocks, you know. So I think the sweet spot is about 20 to 30 stocks. 
you know uh, 20 to 30 stocks uh, spread across uh, you know large cap mid cap small cap will give you a fair bit of you know where all the 20 30 stocks have an earnings tailwind if you build a portfolio like this uh, you can expect to reasonably well uh, you know and uh, you know without without much uh, because even in a bear market what will happen is because these stocks have earnings tailwinds they will not fall so much they will fall relatively less than the rest of the market right unless a new uh, you know a new news comes like like it happened in adani adani park gave you a great number stock went up 50% in a matter of two months and then another news came which completely negated the thesis right which completely put a question mark on the future of the company so unless something like that happens these stocks on an average will always do better than the rest of the market in aggregate because they have an earnings tailwind okay and like broadly to give you numbers based on my experience right so in most cases if you are wrong you know you will lose 10 15% uh, you know, provided that you exit in the next quarter, uh, you know, uh, if the results are not good. Uh, and if you do well on an average, you'll make 20 to 40 percent. So the risk reward is very much, you know, one is to two, one is to three, one is to four on an average case. But there will always be stocks which will do really well. There will be stocks which will, you know, go up, uh, uh, you know, 40, 50, 60, 100 percent also. Uh, and that is the beauty of, like I said, diversification and optionality, right? And the stock which goes up 100% uh, will always be a surprise to us. You know, that's the beauty of the markets, right? So the key remains to improve the skill and try to buy the best candidates. Like I said, you will have too many options in every quarter that will qualify. The skill really is in, you know, doing this for several quarters and, you know, uh, improving your, uh, you know, ability to pick the right stocks. And that is why, that concept of deep dive, which I introduced in the beginning, is very important. Only when you go back and learn, you know, and it needs to pick for the next year. Right. So, how long will it take to build the skill? I would say three to four quarters. If you do this, you will be eighty percent there. And you know, this is the case with everything, right? So, remaining twenty percent will take a decade, right? So that's always the case with everything, but you don't have to, even if you're 80% there, you should do much better rather than blindly doing something or taking some tips. Because see, this is something which is, like I said, structural, right? We are betting, see, what is fundamental analysis? Pure earnings, right? So you are betting not on some random thing, you are betting on real earnings delivery, right? It is not some chart pattern or some technical or somebody told something or something, will happen in the future. So you are betting in this setup purely on earnings delivery. So you so you have a massive edge here, right? So three to four quarters you do this, I think you will be there. Um, you know, I, I keep publishing about these and keep talking about this, uh, you know, in on the below platforms on Twitter, I'm there at Prabhakar Pudwa. And like Ankit said in the beginning of the presentation, I, uh, you know, write a substack called Market Sense where I, talk about you know uh, generally about these uh, you know i list out some of these winners uh, and hopefully in the future you know i can probably try and give you something more real time also so that you know we can learn this as and when it is uh, happening so best of luck and uh, i think that's that's all from my side ankit thank you so much uh, prabhakar it was brilliant and I have many questions, uh, but I'll first open it up for uh, the audience. So uh, I think meet, I'll unmute you first. And anyone else who wants to ask any question, you can just raise your hand. I'll uh, unmute you. So meet, you can go first if you want. Okay. Uh, hello, Ankit Bhai. How are you? Good, good, good. Please, okay. uh, please ask. Hello, Prab uh, hello Prabhakar, sir. Uh, hey, very good presentation. Uh, sir, my question is that first time I got to know about you is in 2019 via Alpha Mughal show. So right. my question is, have you changed your uh, strategy? And if yes, uh, why? And I, I mean the Prabhakar Kudwa uh, in Alpha Mughal talking about ROIC, uh, market share and Prabhakar Kudwa in today's presentation is very different. Is my understanding right or am I missing something? And uh, my second question is, how have you identified Borusil and Hawkins so early? And is it possible that you can identify your past winners like companies uh, with the same pattern which you have explained in today's presentation? 
Yeah, thanks, thanks, Smith. Uh, good question. Uh, something I think I should also reflect myself. You know how how I have evolved. So, Smith, the thing is, there are you know I'm sure you you've been a market participant. I'm sure. Uh, see, there are many ways to make money in the market. There are multiple setups. A lot of people who are making doing very well doing intraday trading. There are so many options experts nowadays. There are so many investors who do value investing, cyclical investing. So what I have discussed today, right? It's it is one setup. Okay, so think of it like that. So it is it is one strategy. You know, call it a positional uh, strategy. Like I said, this is not a buy and hold forever kind of a thing. It is a strategy which will help you make you know uh, pick winners and you know trade magnitude moves for three to four quarters right so this is one setup the roic and market share and you know all of that you know qualifies as another type of investing which i continue to do right so even uh, you know in our, in our pms right so we have two products right so one is called as long term growth and one is called as active alpha so we so I, I run this active alpha you know uh, using the setup that I spoke about now, and the, the, the long term growth is like a core core portfolio kind of an approach where you look at established companies where you look at ROIC where you look at management where you intend to you know buy them during difficult markets and you continue to hold them you know you basically trying to play the compounding game so you know you might own private banks there you might own a DMART there you know. You might own, uh, like I said, I will not buy a DMART here, but in that portfolio, I might own a DMART. A lot of times, however, there will be overlap between the two portfolios. You know? So ITC is a good example. You know, ITC may qualify even in your core portfolio, where you look at improvements in the ROICs, you know, the, the dividend payouts, uh, you know, and also it might be an earnings winner. So to answer the second part of your question, uh, stocks like Hawkins pay was exactly this strategy that you know that was used earlier you know it was basically an earnings surprise if you go back and study the earnings patterns of hawkins and page it was exactly what i spoke about now at that point in time i did not know about it i was uh, you know that clarity of uh, thought was not there at that point in time right that was about 10 years back i think that clarity of thought was not there i was also much uh, younger now uh, you know uh, so, but if I go back and study that now, it was purely, you know, these earnings winners, uh, you know, go back and look at the, uh, you know, top line, bottom line growth of Hawkins in that period. Uh, and also look at the last point I mentioned about peak margin and peak earnings, right? If you want, I can, you know, quickly show you that. Don't have, I'll have the quarterly data going back, but at least on the annual, I'll show you about the peak margin. Yeah, I think even that is not. Just look at this margin here. Okay, the 16% OPM that uh, that Hawkins did in 2000, uh, you know, uh, 11. It was it was not. It's not even. It has never been able to do that. I think there was one quarter where they did 21% OPM. Right, that was the quarter where it was a peak margin, peak earnings kind of a situation. Because after that, for many years, the earnings went nowhere. Look at this 48, 46, 51, 59. It is in that range for four or five years. So peak margin, peak earnings concept, if I knew at that point in time, I could have exited it probably, you know, much earlier. But the core concept remains the same. The buy was triggered by an earnings surprise. You can go back and look at the quarterly data and you will find that whatever we discussed today in the PPT, the exact same thing happened there. Uh, okay, so sir, uh, is my understanding correct that this uh, patterns gives you the rough idea about uh, which stocks are in secular growth pattern and which stocks are in cyclical pattern so that you can trigger your exit when the uh, cycle ends and in secular growth uh, uh, stocks, you can just uh, follow the earnings and management co commentary and guidance. Is my understanding correct? Um, no, I'll, I'll just like to correct you a bit here, Meet, because See what this particular setup is purely a cyclical earnings tailwind, right? So it has it has nothing to do with uh, you know it has nothing to do with uh, what the long term thesis is. Like I said, the long term thesis can be applied only on a few companies where you can take that five year bet. In most of the companies in India, you cannot take a five year bet. You can only take a few quarter bet, right? The five year bet companies, like I said, are the private banks. 
you know the consumption names that is where you can you know uh, take a slightly longer term bet so here i am purely betting on the cyclical tailwind in the the earnings like i showed in that graph when the earnings moves from a low zone when the earning moves from a low zone to a acceleration zone that is what i'm looking for now it doesn't matter to me whether it is a high roic stock or a low roic stock it doesn't matter because what will happen for a low roic stock here is that the roic will improve substantially in this phase and it will remain like that for a few quarters and then again it will revert back to normal what will happen for a good company will be that the roic will increase a bit here and it will again you know it will it will not crash down but it will probably be maintained at that level but i am interested only in that delta phase you know in this particular setup right i am only interested in that delta phase where the earnings suddenly start accelerating see acceleration cannot continue forever you know like they say trees can't you know go to the sky you can't accelerate your car forever you know you can go from 0 to 60 60 to 100 100 to 120 you can't just keep going right so the idea here is to go from you know 40 to 100 or 40 to 120 on on the car you know and then you know that after 120 you are in a you know a dangerous zone so then you sort of slow down and you know get off the stop so the the first portfolio right the the older me you know so to speak is driving your car steadily at a 45 to 50 kilometers per hour speed so that's a different approach it's a different approach i think it's best we don't confuse these two Uh, understood understood and, and sir ha, 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 just one more question sir have you uh, a, a allocate uh, your positions then matlab you al allocate in one go or you average up uh, accordingly with uh, 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 earnings com coming up uh typically in one go because like i said it's very difficult to judge whether the market will give you time to get in or not you know if the market is bad then sometimes you can you know do it you know over a period but it cannot be more than you know a few days you know at the max right uh, oh. but in a bull market definitely and right now we are not in a bull market so the context may not be clear to many people and many people might not even have seen a bull market in bull market things go crazy market just will not give you any time so in a bull market you have to go all in the margin of safety like i said is the diversification the margin of safety is to bet you know lesser on each stock but go in and bet whatever has to be bet on that stock has to be bet on one go so the margin of safety will come more from the number of stocks you have rather than uh, you know the timing of the entry and the exit okay so sir what is the uh, maximum allocation you do in top 5 uh, of your holdings in both the strategies so in this strategy it, no the both the first strategy is a completely different ball game first mm -hmm. strategy you know might be more concentrated you might know, you might own just you know 10 to 12 names so there the you know like i said there i am much more sure you know i am playing the compounding game there you know i am interested in the businesses which will compound for the next 5 6 7 years 10 years right so there the allocations are higher here like i said the typical allocation is between uh, you know 2 and a half to 3 and a half percent per stock in the in the in the, in the earnings surprise end okay got it sir thank you Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Meet, and thank you, Prabhakar, for some great questions. So I'll now unmute uh, Dhruv. Dhruv, you can ask your question. Hi. Thank you for the wonderful presentation, sir. Uh, it was really insightful. The best part was the clarity and the process driven, like you know, to the point approach that you just mentioned. Uh, my question revolves around uh, more on some of the names and and it is more a top down question like you know we are looking at the whole kpex cycle and you know you are seeing a earnings revival and some of the names which we discussed here and which are also there in your latest blog and everything uh, which are showing an earning surprise but uh, two parts like the earning surprise is there but the valuation comfort is not there you know when you look at any valuation parameter the valuation comfort is not there but we also know that in these capex or these cyclical spaces the 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 profits are lumpy and uh, you know you can't really judge them but at the same time like you can't even really forecast them based upon what the management even probably even the management might not know that uh, you know what the numbers would be like or any sort of a growth prospect things like that 
given the fact that you know we are probably at the start of a capex cycle would you tweak your thesis or like how would you like to play that thesis if i have to look at specifically the capex name capital goods things like that yeah thanks dro so no i think i don't try to you know bring in a bias in this particular thing because uh, automatically you know like you said a lot of companies that i have discussed here and what i have put on my blog so automatically the strategy is taking me towards capex names right so it is taking me towards capex names and uh, because that is where the earnings are coming that is where the you know <clears throat> last two three quarters we have seen the earnings are sustainably coming and you know valuations right uh, see whenever a sector is in a bull market if you if you go back and study the valuations always look expensive you know but every every subsequent earning you know uh, sedates the valuation right brings the valuation down so it might look like uh, a 40p 50p stock but if you annualize the current quarters or the next quarters earnings it will suddenly become a 30p stock a 35p stock so the characteristic of a bull market is always that the best of the stocks will always look expensive and that is when you have to participate in them of course this comes from experience right this doesn't come from this strategy uh, if you look at uh, you know go back and study technology or you look at uh, you know the consumer names if you look at any of these companies in the previous cycles right uh, private banks when the bull run is on they will always be expensive and you have to bite the bullet as long as the earnings are coming the biggest mistake people do is that after the bull run is over and the pe starts shrinking then they buy because they feel that the valuation is lower so it's counterintuitive you have, in, when you have established that this bull market is likely to be that of a capex stocks then valuations have to be given second priority it may sound like blasphemy when i'm talking about it but that is how it actually works in the market so because as long as the earnings delivery is there valuations will not matter till the bull market is on right the moment uh, you know the valuations start falling and that will typically happen when the earnings peak out and that is when most of the retail investors will get in right so so you know although a lot of valuations look uh, you know slightly on the higher side compared to their own uh, you know historical averages uh, i would still you know go in and buy them because the earnings are so phenomenal and and the strategy like i said is itself taking me to the capex sector so there is no conscious effort from my side to you know uh, figure out in fact in fact the problem i'm facing is i don't want to be too exposed to this. so there's something called as a portfolio right so you so i have i have to pick and choose you know i have to pick and choose whether i want to own you know uh, an uh, a part or whether i want to own some other stock you know so so Uh, so the problem is on the other side whereby i am you know uh, trying to limit my exposure to certain sectors but it's it's very clear last few quarters the numbers are coming from two or three sectors and that is capex you know and both power and non power capex uh, you know uh, defense you know had a phase of acceleration but it is maintaining the numbers right the acceleration has stopped but it is maintaining the numbers and uh, you know these uh, these tier 2 tier 3 kind of banks you know the private not the private banks but the tier 2 tier 3 kinds of bad banks so that is where the phenomenal earnings are coming yeah uh, if, if if you know i'll just take the example and you may choose not to answer but you know if i just look at uh, abb like uh, and you mentioned you know earlier that you know in an avenue if you get a fair bit of growth you may be a little bit cautious because of the valuation and you know in a mid and small cap you might be Uh, where you would rather choose that seven eight p, but you know if we look at the capex theme and if you are playing that and if you look at ABB specifically, uh, you know it has always been in that sixty eight p sort of range, but it is delivering, you know it is delivering substantially. So how does the thesis play out? Like, can you share your views not on the stock, but you know just taking this as an example or whatever you may, however you may want to answer it, because you know it it's so expensive and although it might deliver, you know there is a lot of tailwinds for the sector and everything. how do you go and analyze and allocate like can you take a big allocation to it whether you should book some profits or whatever but not on a stock specific but in general if you may want to answer it yeah i think uh, see it's see one thing is quite obvious that a stock like abb definitely will underperform 
you know another stock uh, in the a smaller stock in the capex sector if there is a capex bull run yeah yeah, right? yeah so we have seen that right that dlfs and the unitex always outperform an lnt right we've so, seen so that just just to keep it we'll keep it within the large caps so you know so that the comparison is easier that way right so large caps i'll tell you okay so there is abb there is siemens there is cummings there is lnt okay so let's say these are the four names now if you look at the results of cummings this quarter right abb from the, i'm talking purely from this strategy point of view now okay again no no advice and all that but that, you know uh, cummins gave a very good quarter uh, this recent quarter was very good okay and this is probably the first surprise for quarter for cummins abb has been delivering for the last 3 4 quarters so if i have to think about it from an opportunity cost point of view i would switch out of abb and get into cummins so so that's how that's how i would play it you know so within the same sector you can always you know in a bull market you can rotate if you're not comfortable with the valuation because a cummins is a relatively newer uh, you know entry into my setup abb has been there for the last 3 4 quarters now if i don't want to if i want to pick and choose between these i can book out of abb and get into a cummins get into a siemens right so between siemens and cummins again if i have to choose i might get into i, I might see get into cummins because I, i feel that the earnings delivery was much better there than in siemens right so it's that's one angle to look at it but if you are asking me outside of this setup right outside of this setup you know the the best approach that i have seen you know is always a basket approach because like i said one of my big learnings will be always a surprise and will be the one that you least expect you know uh, the stock that looks the most expensive will give you the best returns it's always counterintuitive right because everybody thinks alike and everybody cannot be right so the people who take the risk on the valuation or some element will will get paid for it so the best approach always you know uh, outside of this setup is a basket approach so why not buy all all four you know and uh, you know ride the bull market you know build a basket of capex names across market caps that you want to buy and hold and uh, you know just uh, let the stock market do its thing got it uh, one last question uh, you know uh, given the capex theme and everything would the capex theme merit a part of your long term portfolio at this point of time or still no no very much very much it will it will you you know if if the thesis you know that the market has you know is correct uh, and and you know these capex and uh, you know a lot of these stocks have st- started doing well only recently but if you read the phone calls of a lot of companies like smaller companies like uh, kena metal and all of that you know i i remember uh, so th- if you they those guys are extremely bullish they are saying that the kind of orders we have seen we are we have not seen this in the last 10 years right so it will definitely merit uh, you know a, a place in my core portfolio also but the core portfolio by the nature of it will be higher allocation and that automatically means stick to the top 3 4 names don't try to you know play the you know the, in the smaller names don't try to be too adventurous because you want to be because this if this is a 3 4 year kind of a cycle there will be multiple corrections multiple crashes so we have to build our portfolio such that we are able to sit through them the most you know uh, the best portfolio in hindsight is not the optimum portfolio the optimum portfolio is the one where you can sit through so even if a abb falls 20% you should be able to sit and take it in your stride right so so yes it is a part of my core portfolio but only the larger things thank you thank you very much sir thanks bro <clears throat> thanks bro uh dr suvid i have unmuted you you can ask your question now dr suvid uh, uh hi uh yeah, thanks hi. for the wonderful presentation and thanks angit for this opportunity okay uh very small question um, i am taking a stock specific name you don't need to put it into matlab just to give a context to it now in it if i am i have a i i uh, i am looking at a mid cap it like mastech or anything uh, these other it names and what happens with these kind of companies is that they uh, normally get an order uh, in a quarter which uh, which makes their earnings grow like anything for a, for for that particular quarter and uh, your earnings will show in that quarter and then um, at, at these kind of times uh, earnings uh, so how do you put this 
Uh, so when the, you, I think, I think there was a break in the middle. Uh, can you just repeat the? So in 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 a small in a mid cap set of stock, when um, they they get a single order like in IT, especially in IT, they get a single okay. order which is a very huge order, and uh, like they get an NHS order, uh, the master master gets an NHS order, and that order actually uh, makes their sales and uh, margins grow like anything. And uh, next quarter they don't get that kind of order. So for that quarter the earnings jump and earnings surprise is there. Now, if you buy this over there, the next quarter is gone up, oh, oh, out of thin air. Then how do you play this kind of thing? Because the company is good, but normally big orders come in odd and even quarters. No, you should not play it. You should not play. That's why you know I made a point that you have to find the source of earnings improvement, right? And the like I said, the whole idea is to be able to uh, predict the future quarters and be sure that the future quarters are going to be good. So in a situation like this, it's very clearly known to you, me, and the market that it's a one-time event, right? So it doesn't qualify our setup, and uh, you should not take it. it. It doesn't qualify into this because you clearly know it's a one-time thing. Okay, okay, but then this this can happen again. Matlab, uh, matlab next time they get another sort of order. So this just is like you're a guessing game sort of thing. Then. So see, so with that, that, like I said, every quarter you will get more than hundred opportunities. So we so, okay. so we so we don't have to make money only in Mastic, right? So you, you will get many opportunities. So as far as this particular setup is concerned, you have to ignore it. You hmm. might have hmm. a separate thesis on it that you know, uh, okay, hmm. I, I'll take a chance. I think that you know they'll keep getting orders. So that's a completely hmm. different portfolio. That's a completely different approach. That you are bullish specifically on Mastic. So here, what oh. I my my pattern is first quarter Hello? is good. Yeah, here my pattern is the first quarter is good, and I expect the next few quarters also to be good with a reasonable degree of accuracy. Only then you get it. Okay, okay, okay. Then thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Sovit. So, Parvez, I have unmuted you. You can go next. Parvez. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Prabhakar. Hi, Prabhakar. Uh, Prabhakar, I tell you, this is one of the most brilliant uh, uh, um, videos that I've seen, and I've been a fan of yours for a long time. And uh, what you've come up with is really, really phenomenal. I've been following it for quite a while, and uh, I've seen some tremendous uh, results. Uh, me, along with another friend of mine, have... Uh, um, and but uh, of course there are nuances that we've got to pick up on and and see if we can uh, if we can uh, improve on them. And so in that context, I'd like to ask you a, a few questions. Um, and the questions are uh, in the sense like you know when you are looking at a a huge move in in let's say the um, the the sales or the revenues and the and the profit margins and the and the profit. Uh, uh, also, there are times, uh, uh, Prabhakar, where we've seen, you know, there's a huge jump in all of these, and then there's a there's a, a, a sort of a decline, uh, and uh, of course you've seen a pretty decent jump by then. Then there's a decline, and then again, maybe you know, a quarter or two later, again there's another big jump. Maybe sometimes it's even more significant than the first one. So. Yes. In that context, in that context, when you say that, you know, you get in on the first quarter and then ride it for two, one or two quarters, right? Uh, and then you say, boss, is not moving, so you get out. And then suddenly it takes up again. So uh, yes. what are those, those kind of get a little confusing. If you could just uh, elaborate on that uh, uh, for me, please. Sure, sure. Thanks. Thanks for the kind words, uh, first of all, but uh, ways. Uh, you see, I think I think this is where the, you know really you know experience comes into play, right? Having having uh, see there are, there are certain companies right which which do this. Uh, it's like a compulsive behavior. You know, a lot of companies display this kind of a behavior whereby they will give you a very good one quarter, and then they will give you you know a, a howler in the next quarter, and then again the third quarter will be brilliant. Like you said, you know there, there are several examples and. The fact that you brought it up shows that you you know you are a practitioner, right? Because it's a, it's a very uh, you know uh, important nuance. But to be honest, uh, you know we, we have to take it in our stride. You know there is nothing much we can do. Like I said, 
uh, we have to build a, a database, so to speak, in our mind of such companies which show this kind of behavior, right? And especially this will happen in the you know the mid and small the, the smaller names uh, where the managements are known to themselves play the market, right? You, you know, so you you will uh, so so there is a there is an angle of corporate governance here, you know. Uh, so there are two reasons uh, you know this this will happen. So one, like I said, is uh, the management themselves may be active in the stock, okay? Because there's an informal talk, I, I'm, I, I'm saying all this. So a lot of times in India, you find that the management themselves are active in their stocks. Yeah. And uh, so so they they will try to, you know, play around with the things. Uh, and uh, the second thing is, uh, typically you will see this, uh, uh, you know, in the middle quarters, right? Uh, because the, the most relevant quarter for me, I mean, from today's angle is the Q2 and the Q4. Okay, because you have to now give audited, uh, you know, balance sheets, right, in, in half yearly and, and on the Q4, right. So that is one sort of, a, you know, a hint, so to speak, I can give that if it's, a, you know, a Q2 or a Q4, you can be reasonably sure that the adjustments, you know, so to speak, are less possible, right. <laughs> so if, if the Q1 or Q3 have been the howlers, then maybe you can, if you know the management is a bit of a, you know, a player, then, you know, you can probably give them, you know, one, one more quarter. And, and, and this is where, again, you know, this is where, again, the portfolio construction becomes very important because if the portfolio, you know, if the size of the bet is big, then it is, then we are more likely to get frustrated and we are more likely to, you know, take that, uh, you know, that wrong decision. Right. Uh, but if the bet sizes are relatively smaller, then we can allow the stocks to do their job for two, three quarters, right? Because something else in the portfolio would have done well in this quarter and taken care of your overall returns, right? Yeah. So, it's a, so it's a combination of, you know, this Q2, Q4, you know, knowing the corporate governance and the management and, uh, you know, the portfolio construction. I think all three of them put together should be, allow us to, you know, get out of this uh, conundrum that we face. Yeah, great, great, got it. Um... Prabhakar, second question is, uh, uh, you know, when you when you're building your portfolio, do you do you look at other parameters uh, that give you uh, more of a conviction in getting into into these stocks, or do you just look for these huge jumps in these three or four areas that you that you spoke about? Yeah, I mean, I, I do. I mean, I do look at, like I said, you know, on this slide. Uh, I, I prefer uh, I prefer stocks which are uh, you know like I said de merger candidates IPOs newer industries I, I give them more uh, weightage you know starting valuations matter you know like I was answering earlier right if I had if I was given a choice between buying an ABB and buying a Cummins I'll go for Cummins right if I have to buy between a Cummins and an Apar I'll go for an Apar so starting valuations uh, matter the industry matters. The market cap matters, you know, uh, like I said, if it's a, if I have a company where there is a move across the sector, I will give it more, uh, you know, uh, probably I'll pick that over something which is standalone. Uh, and of course, that quality of neglect, like I said, right? So if, if the stock has had a big move pre the earnings, or if I'm late, you know, if it's a, if I'm choosing between a stock which has given a blockbuster Q2, was you know and which has had a big run because of the q1 also was good and i missed it and if i have to pick a fresh stock i, I will choose a fresher uh, stock so so that's how i would uh, prioritize between the setups okay okay got it uh now as as far as the, your portfolio is concerned uh, uh Prabhaka, do you do you just uh, look for and you talked about compounding which i think is a, is a great way of doing it and this is a super way of doing it when you can compound on on maybe a, a quarterly or 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 a, or a half yearly basis. Uh, so do you do you dilute your entire portfolio and then uh, uh, get into a new one, or or how do you do it? Uh, no, not at all, not at all. So like I said, see, this is a two to four quarter kind of a trade, right? So so the turnover will not ex generally will not exceed the twenty five percent of the portfolio. So. I will have some stocks which I bought last quarter, which you know are in the process of getting re-rated. You know, uh, I'll have some stocks which uh, so only stocks that will exit are you know are, are stocks which are uh, 
you know uh, already moved up you know and we are already into q3 q4 kind of a thing or you know or if the stock gives you uh, extremely bad you know second quarter or extremely bad quarter you know uh, or some other event happens a corporate governance issue happens but typically the turnover won't be more than 20 25% every quarter because I, I i like you know like like you the point you made earlier you know i used to make that mistake you know i used to get impatient and uh, exit in the second quarter if the results were uh, not as great as the first right but you know i i have learned now that you have to give it time you know you have to give it time and uh, that is why i diversified more so that uh, you know i i'm able to give time to the stocks because a lot of time the biggest move will come after the second or third quarter right a lot of times uh, the, the first quarter itself the move may not come so yeah so in that sense the turnover is not so much yeah and uh... And if if you have a a concentrated portfolio, what uh, what would you suggest for a concentrated? Let's say we don't have time, or we miss out on an earnings, and and you know the next day it already has taken off 10, 20 percent. It's hit the ceiling or whatever, and it's a little risky at that time to get in when it's already hit a 20 percent ceiling, and therefore you are lucky in catching something like this. Uh, uh, in the day itself, and you you know you do your analysis and you get in immediately, and therefore you don't you know you want to put in quite a bit of your funds that are there because you don't know if you're going to get another one in time to come. So you might end up with a kind of a concentrated portfolio. Would you suggest at that time that you look for the optimum kind of theses uh, where all of these have really significant jumps and select only those? Or, or 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 what and then you end up with a concentrated portfolio would that work in a concentrated portfolio also um i think to be honest i think you know the, the concentrated approach you know although theoretically seems to be uh, you know the highest uh, expected value but you know see uh, bad events in the see macro events happen in the market like i said the market environment is a big, you know, is a big contributor to our overall returns. Yeah. Right? If this was if this was a bull market, we would have probably made twice of what we made now, right? Yeah. So so sometimes events out of your control will happen in the market, and at that point in time, if you're concentrated and you know, then you are more likely to exit that stock at uh, you know because you're forced to exit, you know. So somehow you know structurally i feel you know given that there are so many variables in the market and you are holding overnight positions for several months a concentrated approach is uh, you know is fraught with the uh, psychological dangers you know where that you take the wrong decisions at the wrong time because you're overexposed yeah. Yeah. because of no fault of the company the, well let's say covid or something right or or let's say some this uh, russia ukraine war or something like that something nothing related to our company you know uh, or the company in question the company can easily fall 20 30 percent right especially in the mid and small cap space so so concentration i would not advise uh, you know for, for this kind of an approach just because you know it, it it gets you do the wrong things at the wrong time yeah but then uh, prabhaka there's a lot of times where you know it it, it you know it, it the earnings breakout uh, shows up or whatever and it, it it takes off, and then it goes into a lull and it comes back down. Now yes. I remember one time you had said that you know if it comes back to the price of the uh, before the earnings free free uh, yes. free yes. earnings uh, uh, yes. price, then that would essentially be your stop loss. At that at, at certain junctures also one has noticed that you know it does come back down, and then from there it gets reiterated again and and, and takes off again within the same quarter. So that might be, would you suggest at that time, if you're looking at it technically and you get a large volume and it's coming down back to where it started from, and there's a large volume there, would you suggest that's a good time to kind of maybe average down or even take the the, the move up there? 
Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a good idea to average down. See, I, I so it depends again. It's that's again now we are going deeper into the nuances, right? So, <laughs> yeah. uh, so now it is: Are you playing it as a swing or a position, or like a short-term position trade, or are you planning to? So, if you're trying to play it as a swing or position trade, a lot of people do what you suggested. That is, they take an initial big position, trade that move for the next uh, few days. You know, when it, when it makes a big move, take partial profits. And you know, have a stop loss and play that move, you know, because you're expecting that the move will just continue and you'll make a quick 15, 20, 30 percent. Yeah. Right? You're not you're not playing, you're not, you know, you're not trying to stick for the whole quarter. Yeah. Right? So if if that that is the kind of uh, portfolio construction, then the rules of the game will change. Like you said, then you do need to have a stop loss. Like if you're betting a large part of your portfolio, then you are playing for what is called as a magnitude move. So what you're asking me is how to play a magnitude move, whereas what I do now is more of a duration move. So I okay. want to hold it for a duration, which is why the way I have done it is by cutting my allocations and not having any stop losses, because it allows the stock to do its job and give me that 50, 60, 70% return without me really getting clustered, right? However, if you have a large position and you make a quick 20, 30%, and you're playing the earnings uh, surprise as a trade, you know, a quick money making opportunity. Then you can bet big, exit quickly in two, three days. And when, then when it comes back, you can choose to average it. But I would again say that the overall allocation will need to be kept in check because there is nothing stopping the stock from falling 20, 30% for no fault of the stock, purely because of the market. Yeah, that's market driven. Yeah. 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 And in in your in your portfolios, when you're holding uh, uh, the two point five to three percent allocation on each stock for say, and yes. you're holding it for three four quarters or whatever, uh, what kind of a, what kind of with that kind of a, a distribution of of funds in your portfolio, what kind of a return are we looking at uh, on a CAGR basis, uh, maybe on an annual basis or whatever? Okay, so there are two three actually uh, the way you manage public money is. Want to be very different from the way you, as an individual investor, you can operate, right? So yeah. the re, one one of the main reasons why I have I have this kind of a diversified portfolio, like I said, is one reason is optionality, and one reason is risk management, right? Yeah. So, so if you have this kind of a diversified approach, you know, even in this market, right, a bad market like this, when the markets have been down, uh, you know, uh, maybe the Nifty has been flat, I believe, last one year. Right. Uh, the this strategy, I think, is up uh, 20, 22%, oh. even with this diversified approach. Fantastic. As an individual investor, you can obviously do much better because you can operate in much smaller names, much more illiquid names. But as a portfolio manager, you have to, you know, put a lot of liquidity checks and, you know, risks yeah. and you know, all of those things. But yeah, we've done quite well. I think last one year we've been quite, uh, we've outperformed by quite a bit. Fabulous. Prabhakar, it's an absolute pleasure speaking with you and look forward to getting in touch with you sometime or the other, maybe even Thank invest us. in your funds. So appreciate uh, your being so magnanimous in sharing what you've, uh, you know, come about with uh, in, in such a open manner. I really appreciate it. it. Says so much about you and your character. Truly appreciate it. Thank you so much, Pervez. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Pervez. Some really good question there. So I think one hand is raised, uh, Nilabja. So I've unmuted you. You can ask your question. Uh, hello, Prabhakar. Yeah, Nilabja, tell me. Okay, first of all, uh, thank Ankit for uh, arranging this. And Prabhakar, I am a great follower of, of the blogs. So it's pretty useful. See, I have one fundamental question. I understand uh, uh, you are, uh, because from your last blog on st second March also, you mentioned pretty bullish on the uh, capital goods and power sector, but uh, including, I am not mentioning the names. Uh, some of the names you have already mentioned. Some of these names, I find they have already reaching their peak margin. Okay, I can mention Appar. In fact, Cummins this quarter result. I see that last uh, last uh, the, this is a, one of the this is a best quarter. And 19 percent is the maximum margin it has reached. So how do you interact Appar also you have mentioned there in your blog and now I have uh, before a disclosure I have also some stake in Appar because already this 9% is management is always bullish because the management wants 
and uh, sometimes what i what some red flag stuff the management starts participating too many analyst calls which happen in some of the small caps uh, so how do you interpret that uh, whether this kind of thing is sustainable or not uh, that is my fundamental question i have uh, because uh, if I go go through all the analyst calls, I, if I take say apart, which is participating a lot of analyst calls, which is a, it is concerning for me. Uh, they are they are saying yes, yes, I can, I will maintain this margin. I have extra for the transformer uh, oils. Uh, the other two are good business and it is sustainable. Uh, I am very bullish on US. Blah blah blah. But is it how you interpret that? Because my problem is not the uh, management or the I will can wait for the next call, but market always know something and start is suddenly discounting and the price can fall up to 20 30 percent in a single day so how do you manage those stuff because uh, my experience i have uh, believed some of management's not happen i can give one example say prk morgan exam can specifically telling because uh, my point is that management is good is uh, from from uh, some of the best uh, pretty professional he was came and the next call it's uh, quarter itself it fell by all from 18 to 3 so how do you manage specifically from capex sector or power sector how you are interpreting now that is my fundamental question very difficult for you to understand except for you are following the some kind of a technical stuff otherwise uh, how do you manage yeah yeah so see two three two three angles here right so one is uh... A lot of these sectors, right, Apar and Cummins, we, because the thesis is that we are at the beginning of a capex cycle, hmm. which has not happened in the last decade, right? Capex has not private capex has not happened in the last, uh, you know, eight ten years, hmm. right? Uh, we cannot yet say that these are peak margin peak earnings, right? So peak margin peak earnings happens hmm. when there has been multiple years of very good numbers. Right, so we are now probably 20 30 percent into the uh, bull market if and when the bull market happens, nobody knows whether it will happen or not. But if it is really happening, then a lot of these companies which belong to a sectoral tailwind, right, we have to give them a little bit more leeway because, like I said, you know, some of these companies are saying that the kind of interest and orders that they are seeing they have not seen in the last 10 years absolutely so absolutely what really happens of course nobody knows but uh, you know so we are playing the odds here so in, in such cases right so because you know where what is peak margin and peak uh, you know this thing is that if this 19 percent has come now but this is the first quarter of 19 percent okay now if if this 19 again next quarter again is let's say 18 percent and then there is 21 percent then there is 25 percent that is when you have to get careful. This is the first part. I don't know whether this will sustain or not. Yes, uh, absolutely. Question. But uh, if ma I have seen, uh, I completely agree, but my, sorry, I have to interrupt. I have seen because if the 19 becomes 17, 17 and a half and 18, which is reasonable and top, even yes. there is top line growth, market reacts very badly. See, it even will, will. Uh, market okay. reacts uh, very badly. So uh, that is uh, that is also a challenge. No, it, it depends on, I tell you, when the market reacts badly, now let us say uh, next quarter the margins come at seventeen percent, like you said, mm -hmm. okay? and and between now and the next quarter, Cummins has gone up by 30 40 percent. That is when the market will react badly. If Cummins has gone up only by 10 15 percent, then the market will not react so badly. So the so the context of what move has happened prior to the result is very important. So if Cummins has already run up 20 30 40 percent, then we have to maybe book some profits. Or you know do do whatever we have to do, but keeping that aside, uh, the larger point that I'm trying to make is mm -hmm. like like I said earlier, if this 19 becomes 17, and given that we are talking about a multi-year capex cycle, then I have to give it a leeway, and even if it corrects by 10, 20 percent, I have to take it in my stride. And maybe that, that is a good buying opportunity also. It depends on how you look at it. I mean, yeah. I uh, you know. Uh, like I said, for this particular setup, I may not buy because it is not accelerating. I am just giving it more chance. Okay, now in, in my this setup, I like I said, I have, I have about 25, 30 names. So about 3% odd I buy across portfolio. And I I cannot make it 6% because that is against my portfolio construction. So I have bought my 3%. Now there is no question of averaging. The question of averaging only will come, like I said, if that 3%, it has stock has rallied by 30, 40% and I've booked some profits. 
then if it corrects back i can add something but otherwise point number 1 i am going to give it some time because it belongs to a sector where there is a bigger thesis of a 3 4 year kind of a you know a cycle number 2 let us say worst case it comes out you know nothing happens you know quart quarter 2 it is 17% quarter 3 it comes to 15% back to where it was okay in that case you have to get out i mean you have to take that loss and get out because you know you you have to make money elsewhere so you have to take it you know you have to take it uh, quarter by quarter you know so to speak so we cannot uh, make uh, yes okay okay i got your point thanks a lot but uh, how to interpret uh, my this is my last question i know uh, how to interpret specifically for says there is a sectoral tailwind and the management is uh, is a decent management you know the management delivery uh, assume that uh, and the management said okay i cannot give you 8 19% everything i will work in a band okay i will work in a band 17 to 19% and my top line say growth by 20% lot of management gives like one of the tra- companies i am tracking say tata communication clearly saying that 23 to 25% i am give and his main uh, growth is coming from the word data business which is giving a double digit growth which is very good for me but market has reacted very badly okay man, because just one person here and here so how do you interpret those results then because uh, business is good management is selling see for me 19% growth margin every day every quarter not possible i will give you a band over a period of the uh, next 2 to 3 years my band is this i will go not go below 70 But not go beyond 90 knots, which is a part safer. But my top line will minimum growth 18 to 20 percent. How do you interpret those kind of stuff? No, no. See, that is a completely different thesis. What we are, what we are doing here is completely different. See, okay. like I said, we are playing the delta on the earnings. Okay, like I said, if coming and for the next six, seven, eight quarters, I may not be there in Cummins. I may be in something else. i am interested in this setup okay we are talking about two different things you are talking about a fundamentally bullish thesis on let us say comments like because that's the example we are taking and you want to buy and hold it for a while you want to play the cycle because i uh, know no, my fundamental question also same that the so you're coming to your source your sources of earning is still intact that come that powers the power sector tailwind is there and comments is said i have a steady order book but there may be certain deep or something like that but so the, i cannot comment because of the very dynamic situation bad uh, external agree, situation agree. i am not giving you any specific uh, thing but i will work in a band but the whole past sectoral tailwind is still there that is you can main make out from multiple uh, companies agreed, agreed. agreed but i am i am interested when the 15 becomes 19 and 19 becomes uh, you know when 19 becomes uh, Or twenty one, and then when you know after that, I am not interested because twenty one cannot become thirty. Okay. So I want acceleration. I want the acceleration to be there. So I only want to be there in the stock in this strategy. Okay, I am again and again clarifying when there is that acceleration phase of the fundamentals. When the fundamentals are accelerating, only then I am want to be there. After that, Cummins may continue to have this margin of nineteen to twenty one percent for next few years. at i am not bothered i am not bothered when, when the delta change is happening that is when i want to enter and once it again goes into a steady state i want to exit that's my best case the worst case is because of this number now i i am bullish comments okay but let's say comments disappoints for next two quarters i have to take my loss and exit because the delta is not coming through whereas you who are individually bullish on comments can continue to hold it for much longer and even make money from it right so that to, so we have to have a clarity of thought of exactly what we are doing you are a buy and hold investor in comments i am trying to play the delta in comments so my time frame and my expectations are completely different from you so I that pl- that is the difference great great thank you thanks a lot and uh, thanks a lot, wish you all thank the best thank you thank you thank you neelab ji for asking the question uh It's one p.m. already. I have a few questions from my side, and there is one question uh, hands being raised. Just wanted to know from you, Prabhakar, how are you uh, placed on time? Yeah, we can. I think another ten or fifteen minutes is fine. Great. So, Jay Prakash, I have unmuted you. I think you can ask your question.
Jay Prakash, I have unmuted you. You raise your hand. Okay, so maybe he's not asking question now. So, uh, Prabhaka, I'll come with my, my questions now. So, number one question is, first of all, fantastic session. Uh, this is something completely opposite of what I do. So, I got to learn a lot of new things today. And that is the main purpose of asking you to present uh, to our platform because I, I knew that this will be something new for all of us. So, uh, I saw earnings taking the center stage of your presentation. Uh, and specifically surprise in earnings, if I got it right. Uh, but I didn't find any mention of management quality and competitive strength or business model. So how do you think on these two aspects when you invest in these earnings surprise or do, do you completely ignore them? Okay, so uh, let me clarify again, okay? Like, you know, <clears throat> like, uh, you know, Meet, Meet said uh, earlier, so there is a lot of this confusion. See this, what we're talking about in this presentation is something very specific. Okay. Now, you know, I also have a different core portfolio and, you know, everybody will have a different core portfolio where all of these things of management, ROIC, all those are excellent things. All those are important, but that's a different approach, right? But when it comes to this approach, you know, as long as the company is not an outright fraud, and if a company is an outright fraud that you know about, or like I said, those circuit stocks, you know, where this, they just go on circuits, uh, you know, and just come down on circuits, liquidity is just not there. Other than that, in this strategy, nothing else matters. The management doesn't matter. So when I say management doesn't matter, it, what I mean is uh, the management is good, bad, sleepy. The market's reaction to those stocks may differ. Like I put in my presentation also, Sometimes the market is more trustworthy to certain managements. That is a nuance. If I have to pick between two options, I'll pick a company where the management is better, especially when I'm managing public money, right? Even if I know that the returns might be slightly lower, I don't want to take a risk of managing, you know, putting the money with somebody shady. But as far as the strategy itself is concerned, there is no importance of the management because like I explained earlier, this is a pure delta game. Right? A very bad company, in fact, can be the best candidate for this because its earnings will be gone to the dogs. And suddenly when you see a improvement in earnings, you will get the biggest delta in unknown companies, you know, which actually nobody will, you know, want to touch. And that is the element of neglect that I spoke about. In my presentation, I think the word neglect is used four or five times, right? And the more the neglect, the more unknown the management, the more unknown the company, the better it will work. So, so purely from this strategy point of view, as long as there is earnings delivery happening, you know, the other items, uh, you know, are, are very much secondary and they will play a very small role. They will not play a zero role, but they will play a very small role. Got it. Got it. So I, I like the clarity as to kya karna and what to ignore. Yes. Yes. Actually, that's, that's really good to know. Uh, so one of our Mission Smile member, uh, Avdud Joshi, who couldn't attend the session, but he passed on a very good question. And he has been a, uh, an ardent follower of your work. So uh, first of all, he asked me to thank you for your post-earning uh, announcement drift, PEAD. Uh, that has uh, worked well for him also. So his question is, uh, you started up as a very concentrated uh, investor. As in, at one point of time, you used to invest all your money in one stock. And from there, today, in this presentation, you are talking about uh, being diversified. So if you can share that about your journey as to how it led to uh, from one stock to now, say, 20 stock no, over a period of time. No, I think the simplest insight, you know, from this thing I learned is, you know, this particular thing, right, optionality. The idea of, because even if I remember that 2011, that, that period, you know, we were just starting out that time and not that we had a lot of capital also, but, you know, because I was more focused on a Hawkins and a page, there were so many other companies which that even better, you know, the Astral, Symphony, Avanti Feeds. So even if you had a small allocations to each of them, you could have done significantly better, right? So the idea of optionality is uh, very underrated, both in investing and in business, right? 
if you see any of the large businesses today the tech business right the meta i mean or the microsoft it is all uh, an optionality game you know they are betting on five different things you know machine learning ai virtual reality so you are creating more and more optionality in your business in your life in your investing and and you know i have seen that it gives you that much more uh, you know opportunity to do much better than what you thought by doing just one stock you are telling the universe that i know what what is good for me right but by spreading it out to a reasonable number like i said you can't do 50 100 then you're diluting it but if you spread it out then you are giving the universe an opportunity to you know uh, give you something outside somewhere and like i said it, that that is where the element of luck and you know exposing yourself to luck also is important no so i i learned after that cycle that so many big names i missed you know i might have done okay in hawkins and page and all that but so many big much bigger winners were there which i knew i had seen i had analyzed we, we had discussed with so many peer investors but i never participated you know in meaningful in them so that's how the change happened but it took a decade you know to understand it intellectually and to really understand it in your bones are two different things right so for me it took you know close to you know a decade to really get it into my bones and uh, couple couple this with uh... what you already uh, said during your presentation that the stocks which you think will do well will probably absolutely. not do as well as you think absolutely absolutely the best, i have the best. similar things uh, in my portfolio as well the ones it's which i am more bullish on will <laughs> uh, true for everybody right it's the best performing stock in your portfolio will always be a surprise right, right. none of us are that so, good <laughs> <laughs> so uh so atul rawal ji uh, he is also a mission smile member and he uh, he takes a monthly session every uh, month for us uh, and he's a a specialist in micro cap space and he's been doing that for 30 years he has made a very good question over here uh, he says that in case of seasonal businesses this method might lend further strength when any lean quarter also delivers good delta so he gives the example of uh, varun beverage uh result in december 2022 absolutely. any comment or any uh, any follow up point on that absolutely absolutely so this this setup uh this setup can be uh, layered on top of your current expertise and that is the beauty of this right so like uh, you know uh, like you said uh, because he is a expert in stocks he has been tracking these stocks i'm sure he has been tracking varun beverages a lot to know the nuances of varun beverages that this is a seasonally bad quarter you know and only uh, you know that that is exactly what i was showing in hal also right hal also while to a naked eye the delta may not look big because the biggest quarter is march so the 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 rally really started in the seasonally weak quarter so it's a very pertinent and a very good observation that you know if you have an additional edge like that where you understand a company very well and if you can because see, it's all about guessing the future the entire market is about what is what what are we all doing as analysts right we're guessing the future and how do you guess the future is it, it is by getting odds in your favor so 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 if you have a, you know an insight you know like this that this company i know this company this typically this quarter is bad and suddenly now this quarter turns out to be good now that is something only you can do because you know about it a general man will never you know it will not come in his radar so it's very pertinent and absolutely true and it happens in many companies for me also because i've been tracking them you know quarter after quarter for many years that you will be able to pick certain stocks which other people will not be able to pick thank you thank you so much uh, prabhakar it was really great uh, listening to you and uh, thank you so much all the attendees also for asking some really good question and uh, we'll soon uh, keep the uh, put the recording also on our website and later on on our youtube channel also so that more people can learn from your uh, knowledge and experience thank you so much prabhakar thanks a lot ankit thanks. and thanks a lot everybody for uh, patiently listening for two hours thank you okay thank you thank you okay.